everyone. First, I would like to thank uh, the IMP and the Burn Steel Award uh, for the Burn Steel Award and giving me this opportunity to share my research with you uh, here today. Um, my name is Fang Yu, and I was a graduate student at Dr. Ju Chen's lab at the Rockefeller University. Today, I will share with you about my thesis work on the structural studies of the human cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, CFTR. First, I would like to go into a little bit background about why we care about this protein specifically and how it is relevant um, pathologically and biologically. So CFTR encodes for a protein whose mutations that directly leads to a disease called cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a really devastating disease which affects uh, one out of 2,500 people in Caucasian populations. And it is also a systematic disease that affects many organs with epithelial surfaces, such as lungs, heart, and intestines. And the most severe symptoms are, are centered around the respiratory system. If we zoom into lung directly, we can see how CFTR plays a role in disease manifestation. So first, we are looking at the cross-section of a normal airway. The airway is always aligned with a thin layer of mucus, which allows for efficient gas exchange and clearance of pathogens. And this thin layer of mucus is maintained by the correct functioning of uh, CFTR. CFTR are chloride channels which are expressed in the apical surface of the lung epithelia, which upon its opening allows for the chloride ions to be secreted, which acts as a driving force for fluid secretion. On the other hand, the mutations on CFTR cause it either not to express or not functioning properly on the lung epithelia. Therefore, in cystic fibrosis patients, the driving force for fluid secretion is gone, which interferes with their respiration and also allows a thick layer of mucus to accumulate. And this is a nice environment for bacteria and virus to stay and cause infections. So for them, it is a very miserable life that they have to experience. So what we want to do is to look at the, the protein in its atomic level to see uh, what can we learn from it and hopefully provide a template for future drug design towards cystic fibrosis. Biologically, CFTR is also very interesting that it belongs to the family of ATP binding cassette transporter, ABC transporters, but it is the only known ion channel in this family. Usually, typical ABC transporters are shown in the top panel here, utilize the energy from ATP binding and hydrolysis to pump the substrate against its concentration gradient. So they have uh, two transmembrane domains, TMDs, which line the translocation pathway and sits in the membrane, and two nucleotide binding domains, which are separated or closed in response to ATP, such that they can alternatively change their conformation to pump the substrate against their concentration gradient. However, for CFTR, although it has a similar domain structure, it is actually an ion channel. What it means is that when it binds to ATP, it forms a continuous ion conducting pathway to allow the chloride ions to flow down its concentration gradient. So it will be interesting to study how it can achieve such transformations. On the other hand, inside the cell, there's always saturating amount of ATP, but uh, CFTR is not always open. This is because uh, CFTR also have an additional regulatory domain, which has to be phosphorylated before ATP can bind and induce channel opening. Therefore, there are two big questions that we want to carry into our study. First, what features does CFTR have to allow its transformation from a transporter to a channel and, and how it is regulated structurally? And uh, moreover, how can, can we use the structural approaches further to learn how do current drugs work? 
To answer those questions, first we saw the structure of a CFTR in its defosphorylated ATP free state, as shown in the picture here. The CFTR is encoded by a single polypeptide chain, starting from its N terminus is its uh, transmembrane domain 1, followed by nucleotide binding domain 1, and the R domain is inserted in the middle. At the end, it has its transmembrane domain 2 and NDD2. So when we first look at the CFTR structure, what immediately very obvious is that the CFTR actually looks like other canonical ABC transporters in its resting state, with two TMDs lying the ion conducting pathway and the two nucleotide binding domains, which are separated from each other in this ATP free state. What's interesting is that we were able to resolve part of the flexible regulatory domain, the R domain. So we can see actually when R domain is dephosphorylated, it inserts in between the two TMDs and two NDDs, which prevent any potential channel opening, even if there's any ADDs around. So we know that CFTR is strictly selected against a cations, well anions to efficiently go through how it achieves this function structurally. So when we look at the CFTR structure, what immediately very obvious is that there are lots of positive residues in the transmembrane region. Thanks to all the mutagenesis uh, electrophysiological studies of down in the field, we can map the residues which are important for the ion permeation of CFTR, shown in the magenta here. So from those observations, we can see that actually CFTR's ion conducting pathway, shown in the gray mesh here, acts as a, like a positively charged reservoir to allow anions to efficient go through while strictly select against cations. We saw the structure of the CFTR in its phosphorylated ATP bound state, which corresponds to its open state. What we have observed is that upon phosphorylation, the R domain dislodged from in between the two TMDs and NDDs to interact with the outside of the NDD1, which allows ATP to bind and cause channel conformational change and channel opening. By comparing the two structures, we can now have a clear picture of how CFTR is regulated by phosphorylation. So basically, we can saw that when an R domain is dephosphorylated, it acts as a steric hindrance for any potential conformational change, while after phosphorylation, the addition of negative charges on the R domain allow its relocation to the outside of the channel which favors ATP-induced channel opening. Another feature that we have observed that is very special in CFTR and we think is very important for its gating as well is that CFTR has a special transmembrane helix TM8. So from both structures, we have shown the TM8 in cylinder here. So we saw that the TM8 has helix loop helix transition in the middle of the membrane, which is quite rarely seen in transmembrane proteins because the melting of the helix will expose the unsatisfied hydrogen bond to the hydrophobic core of the membrane, which is intrinsically not energetically favorable. So it is uh, natural to think that it must have carried some important function with it. And consistently, there has been a mutation observed directly in this loop region. So when a leucine is mutated to a rigid proline, the mutation itself can directly lead to cystic fibrosis. So after we have an idea of how CFTR works, uh, we are now um, ready to proceed to see um, how some of the current drugs work. There have been two types of drugs CFTR correctors and CFTR potentiators that have been developed so far to treat cystic fibrosis by directly targeting the CFTR itself. Those drugs are amazing in treating cystic fibrosis, but since they are discovered through high throughput screening, uh, we don't know how exactly they function and where their bending sites are.
the classes that I have been focusing on are called CFTR potentiators. Um, CFTR potentiators such as Eva Capital, which is a FDA approved drug developed by Vertex and GLP G1837, which is an investigational drug, they bind to CFTR in when they are expressed on the cell membrane, but those mutations cause the CFTR to not be able to open. So they favor the opening of CFTR. After we have solved the structure of those potentiators bound to CFTR, we found that those potentiators actually bind at the flexible region of the TM8, which again helps us the transmembrane aid is very important for the gating of CFTR. And this site could be an allosteric site, uh, which can be regulated to favor channel opening. What's even more interesting is that although we can see that the VX770, which we call Eva Capter, and the GLBG1837 look quite chemically dissimilar, they bind at the same site around the TM8, which tells us that this site could be a hot spot for future drug development. We further characterize the interactions that are important for the drug binding and found that aromatic interactions and hydrogen bonding are critical for their binding and functioning. With that, I would like to thank the whole lab, especially my supervisor, Dr. Ju Chen, and the, a past member of our lab, Dr. Zhe Zhang. We have been working on the same CFTR project. I would also like to thank Gatsby Lab, McKinnon Lab, Shortcut Cat Lab, and Rockefeller Cloud EM Center for the help on the data collection and the useful discussions. And I would also like to thank my program, the Tri-Institutional PhD Chemical Biology Program and the Rockefeller University for funding me for the past few years and also the funding sources of the lab. And I would also like to thank you so much for your listening and having me here today. Thank you.